Are you struggling to illustrate the complex interactions between system components for your project? If so, you need to learn more about creating a sequence diagram. Stick around, I'm showing you how. Hey, Doc Squad, Dr. White here with the Business Analysis Doctor. Today, I'm giving you a detailed tutorial on sequence diagrams. But before we get started, if you want more business analysis, training, and tips, be sure to subscribe to the page and turn on the notification bell. With that said, let's get started. Now let's talk about what you'll learn. We'll discuss what a sequence diagram is. We'll look at the various levels of detail of the sequence diagram. We'll go through the main components, discuss sequence diagram best practices, and then we'll go through a practical example of a sequence diagram. So what's a sequence diagram? A sequence diagram is a unified modeling language, or UML, interaction diagram that represents the interactions and communication between the various objects within a system over a specific period of time. Sequence diagrams illustrate the flow of messages in between entities showing the order in which these interactions occur. A sequence diagram is used to illustrate the chronological order of users and system interactions, to communicate usage scenarios of a system or solution, to explore complex logic of a function, procedure, or operation, or to convey additional details about a use case. Let's explore this usage a little further. A key feature of the sequence diagram is that it illustrates the order or sequence in which events take place, which is a function that a use case diagram does not serve. When a particular use case within a use case diagram needs to be further explored, it can either be outlined as a use case description or exploded into a use case diagram. You can learn more about use case diagrams and use case descriptions from the link in the description. Now, let's look at the various levels of detail. The first is the system sequence diagram. A system sequence diagram is a specific type of diagram that focuses on the interactions between the external actor and the system as a whole. It illustrates the input and output events related to the system. A common example you might see is a customer interaction with an ATM. The system sequence diagram is a conceptual view that captures the high-level messages exchanged between the actor and the system, omitting the internal details of the system's behavior. It only represents the main success path. System sequence diagrams are typically used to represent the flow of events triggered by an actor's request or an input to the system. This level of the sequence diagram helps in understanding the primary interactions between the system and the external actors and serves as a starting point for designing the system's use case scenarios. Next, we have the subsystem level. Here, the system is decomposed into the various system components within it. For example, an ATM system might include the ATM user interface, the bank server, and other components like a bank database. The subsystem level sequence diagram is the most commonly used level and focuses on how the external actors and the various system components interact to accomplish a specific use case. It captures the next level of details, including the order of messages between the objects, the flow of control, and the time sequence of these interactions. The subsystem level is typically used to represent the dynamic behavior of a single use case or specific scenario. This level helps to understand how various system components communicate and exchange information during a particular operation. Now let's discuss the object level. Here, the components within the system are referred to as classes. Classes define a common structure and behavior that multiple objects can share. In the object level, we decompose the classes into objects, creating a more detailed view of the sequence diagram. The focus on the sequence diagram at this level is on the interactions and messages exchanged between objects rather than the classes themselves. In the object level sequence diagram, an object is an instance of a class, and it shows the progression of the object's state over time as the messages are exchanged. So continuing with our ATM example, the ATM system is decomposed into components one being the ATM user interface, and then we can decompose the user interface into various screens, such as the home screen, the account information screen, and any other screen or interface within the ATM. The object level sequence diagram 
provides a detailed view of the interactions between individual objects or instances of classes within a specific use case or scenario. This level shows the sequence of method calls, message exchanges, and the flow of control between the objects as they collaborate to achieve a particular task. These diagrams are highly specific and are used to understand the dynamic behavior of the system during the execution of specific operations. The object level diagrams are essential during the implementation phase as they guide developers in writing the code for the individual objects and their interactions. Now let's look at the main components of the sequence diagram. This includes topic, object boxes, actor, activation box, lifeline, message, return message, and alternative frame. Now let's further explore each of the components. The topic describes the scenarios and interactions within a system. It's essentially the name of the use case the diagram is illustrating the details of. For example, user login. Object boxes are the elements that are included within the system of a scenario. They're represented by rectangles and labeled as the class, object, or element that it represents. For example, ATM user interface. In an object level sequence diagram, they may include additional details regarding the specific objects being analyzed, as well as the class that it falls under. For example, the home screen user interface is an object within the overall ATM user interface class. Each object box has a designated column and exchanges of information. These columns organize the elements horizontally along what is called the object dimension. Generally, the objects involved in the operation are listed from left to right according to when they enter the operation, but they can also be listed in any order that allows for the most clarity in the diagram. An actor is an element that is external to the system of the scenario that performs the function. This can be a human, organization, or external system. It's represented by stick figures and also has a designated column and exchange of messages. It's best practice to place the initiating actors on the leftmost side of your diagram. Place reactive system actors on the rightmost side of your diagram. An activation box represents the period during which an object becomes active and becomes idle in the scenario. It's illustrated by a thin vertical rectangle spanning from the start of the object activity to the end of the object activity. Every activation box has an initiation point and a completion point to indicate how long the object is active in a particular operation. The longer the activation box, the more time it takes for that particular object to be completed. An activation box also conveys the focus of control. This is the period during which the activation box is performing an operation or processing is occurring. This is also known as the execution occurrence. Generally, any filled space in the activation box will indicate the execution time, and the non-filled space indicates the wait time in the element. Each object also has its own activation box. The call that initiates the activation box is represented by a solid line with an arrowhead leading to the activated object. The lifeline represents the lifespan or start to end of an object or actor during the scenario over time. It's drawn as a dashed line that vertically spans from each object or actor to the bottom of the diagram. The lifeline can be terminated with an X. This means that the object is no longer active in the scenario. A message is any information or interactions between two objects. It's shown as a labeled solid arrow. Messages are labeled with a description to describe the action or the purpose of the communication between the two objects. These are known as message signature. The signatures can either be above the message line or between the message line with spacing in between. It depends on the app used to draw the diagram. An example of a message description might refer to information or an action taken, such as insert card. When creating sequence diagram at the subsystem level, it might be beneficial to add the argument to the message call to add additional context. Arguments are an optional piece of information or data that's sent along with the message to provide necessary details or input for the operation to be carried out. They provide parameters to a function when calling during the communication. These arguments can be simple values, complex data structures, or even references to other objects. 
The receiving object uses these arguments to perform the requested task accurately. For example, for the message named insert card, the argument would be something like card info, because this is the information the sender is providing to the receiver. Another optional notation is the return type. Return types refer to the kind of response or information that the sender expects to receive back from the receiver after the message is processed. It represents the output of the operation. In some cases, the return type could be a specific value or it might be void, meaning no specific value is returned. An example here for a message named insert card with an argument of card info, the return type could be a validation status, which would indicate whether or not the card is valid to move forward with the verification process. For the object level sequence diagrams, the message format may include specific values for the arguments and return types. Here you might have an argument that includes the card number, while the return type would indicate if the card was valid or invalid. Now, let's look more at how messages operate. Messages flow from the activation box of the object sending the message toward the activation box of the object receiving the message. The order of the message is represented by moving further down the lifeline vertically with each message. The first message is shown at the top of the diagram and the last message is shown at the bottom. Both the ordering in which objects enter the operation and the sequence of the messages are illustrated vertically along the time dimension, as you can see here. The time dimension illustrates the order of the components, not their duration in the operation. Another optional notation is to number the messages according to the sequence in which they occur. There are two general types of messages. The first is the synchronous call which is a message that transfers control to the receiving object. In other words, the sender cannot send new information until a return message is received. The next type of call is an asynchronous call. This is a message that allows the object to continue processing after sending the information. The object may send many signals concurrently, but can only receive one return message at a time. A return message is a reply or information sent from the receiving object back to the original sending object. They're illustrated with a dashed line, most often moving from right to left. Notice the return calls have a stick arrowhead instead of a filled arrowhead. Return messages are an optional part of the sequence diagram, depending on the level of abstraction being modeled. These are useful if more detail is required. Otherwise, the invocation message or regular message is fine. Return messages are labeled the same way as regular messages to describe the information being requested or returned. For example, a pin request to the user once the card is entered in the ATM. Return messages occur once the receiver object is done processing the message and is returning control to the sender object. Lastly, we have the alternative frame. These represent interactions that may have multiple outcomes for message interactions, usually stated as the primary condition of a message interaction, followed by the alternative condition that could occur. An alternative is a type of combination fragment illustrated by a large rectangle called a frame. A combination fragment is used to show complex interaction between objects in a structured way. In addition, alternative fragments are used to manage other complex interactions such as options or loops. The option combination fragment is used to indicate a sequence that will only occur under a certain condition. Otherwise, the sequence won't occur. It models the if-then statement. Loop fragments are used to represent a repeating sequence. Place the word loop in the name box and the guard condition near the top left corner of the frame. Since the alternatives are the most common type of combination fragment, I'll be demonstrating an alternative frame. Alternative frames have a dashed line going through it, creating two separate interaction operands within the fragment. An interaction operand is a container that represents the scenario that you add to a combined fragment. The alternative frame surrounds the message interaction that can have multiple message outcomes. The syntax in the message box includes condition, 
which is the primary or most common outcome of the message interactions, and else, which is the less common condition of the message interaction. For example, in an ATM transaction, when the user inserts the card, the server verifies the card. Note that the notation we're using is called a reflexive message or self-message. These are used when an object sends a message to itself instead of to another object. This often happens when there is some type of verification required in the operation. The primary condition is what would happen if the card is valid, which is the ATM requesting the PIN from the customer. The alternative else scenario is what would happen if the card is not valid, which would be displaying an invalid card error. Also note that the if valid and else conditions are referred to as guards. A guard is a condition that must be met for a message to be sent to the object. Each operand within the fragment has a guard to test against. Now let's look at sequence diagram best practices. First, only use sequence diagrams for complex logic. A common mistake is designing too many sequence diagrams for every use case. If the logic is simple and easy to build, having a sequence diagram won't add much value. Next, display the associated use case name on the diagram. Including the name of the use case that the sequence diagram is derived from provides a traceability back to your functional requirements. Essentially, the diagram should match the textual description associated with the use case. Name actors consistently with the associated use case. Aligning the actor names with the associated use case provides traceability back to the user classes and roles, so we know who is performing the function. Focus only on critical interactions. Adding too much detail to the sequence diagram by trying to include every interaction clutters up the model and makes it difficult to read and understand. Aim for left to right flow of messages. In sequence diagrams, the message flow should start from the top left corner. Since it's the practice in Western culture to read from left to right, actors and objects should follow this route. But there are exceptions when it comes to this logical flow. For example, when object repairs invoke operations on each other, or there's a return message. Also, for the system and subsystem level sequence diagrams, be sure to use simple business language to label the elements. As with any diagram, using simple business language makes the diagram easier to interpret and understand. And finally, ensure the origin of the message flows are clear. In sequence diagrams, it's critical to understand which actor or object initiates the message so that it's easy to determine the flow of control at a specific time in the diagram. Now let's go through an example of a sequence diagram for an ATM system. First, we'll identify the user and the key components within the ATM system. Now let's go through the sequence. First, the customer inserts the ATM card. Now the ATM service passes the card info to the ATM network to check the card. Note that this interaction creates the ATM network activation box. The ATM network verifies the card as indicated with the reflexive message. This interaction also introduces an alternative frame since there are two possible outcomes here. If the card is valid, the ATM network will send the card valid status to the ATM service. This will request the PIN from the customer. If the card is invalid, the ATM network will send the card invalid status to the ATM service. This else scenario will then prompt the customer to remove the card. Now let's resume the main path that assumes the card is valid. Here, the customer inputs the PIN number. The ATM service sends the PIN to the ATM network to confirm. Here, the ATM network will verify the PIN, as well as introduce another alternative frame. If the PIN is valid, the network will send the valid status to the ATM service which will then prompt the customer for the withdrawal amount. If the PIN is invalid, the network will send the invalid status to the ATM service. Notice that this is the point where the ATM network activity ends in the operation. So we can add a termination marker here. Now the ATM service will prompt the customer to remove the card. Next, let's resume the main path that assumes the PIN is valid. Here, the customer inputs the withdrawal amount then, the ATM service sends the amount to the bank database to check the funds. The bank database verifies the funds. This will introduce another alternative frame. If the funds are sufficient, the bank database will send the funds available status to the ATM service. The ATM service will dispense the cash and prompt the customer 
to retrieve the cash and card. If the funds are insufficient, the bank database will send the insufficient fund status to the ATM service, and the ATM service will prompt the customer to remove the card. Well, there you have it, folks. This is what you need to create a clear and effective sequence diagram. If you have any questions, be sure to ask them below, and I'll be sure to get back with you. Also, be sure to check out all the business analysis training and certification resources available at thebadoc.com. As always, thank you so much for watching and have a productive and prosperous day. Bye now.